Well, good afternoon, everybody. I ask the request of you. Some of you really are nodding your heads, and that's not the answer yes either. Some of you are about to go to sleep. Well, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to put you to sleep here in just a minute. And uh, uh, the only request is uh, don't snore when you do. And uh, just kind of go to sleep sw quietly, you know. It's been so good to be with you. Thank you, preacher, for the invitation allowing me to stand in this place. I don't take it for granted. I, I count it as a real honor, and I mean that most sincerely. It's a, it's a precious a treat to me and an honor for me, and I count it a privilege each and every time. It's good to see what God's doing. It's exciting. I don't see this everywhere, and I, I hope you recognize that. Uh, my wife and I are almost somewhere different every week, and... Uh, there are some places really struggling, really having times. And uh, my wife, very caringly, will drive away some, from some place and say, I don't know how they pay the light bill. They're really struggling. 2020 really did a lot of damage, more than just in health, and has really affected some ministries uh, terribly. And they haven't come back from it. So I'm excited to see what God has done here at Pickerington, and stay faithful, stay plugged in, stay active, and uh, God honor you for that. You pray for my wife and I as we travel, and that God would give us safety, and that God would use us wherever we go. We enjoy being together. That's a good thing, and uh, I guess some evangelists are glad when they go on the road, and but I'm glad she's on the road with me, and it means, uh, means a lot. I'd like for you to take your Bible this afternoon and turn to First Peter, would you please? I, I want to give you uh, something to think about. Not that I'd preach for you not to think about, but something that invades every one of our lives somewhere a long time, and not only once, once but oftentimes in our life, and that is adversity, trials, troubles, difficulties. Uh, you know, God doesn't say, I'll save you from them, but He does say He'll go through them with us in the promise of never leaving us nor forsake us. I doubt very seriously there's a family in this audience today that hasn't been touched with heartache somewhere in life's journey so far. And uh, we all have, you know, the death of a parent, of a sibling, of a friend, whatever. Or loss of a job or problems in a marriage. And, you know, that list can just go on and on and on. We're all touched by, by one way or another. And the reason for that is we're flesh. We're, we're human. And uh, God saves the soul, but... We've got to put up with the flesh as long as we're alive. And sometimes uh, we understand watching the world collide with itself because they have no place to go. They do, but they don't use it. The Christian, you and I, we have a place. And uh, it's, it's a choice. It's an option. It's not an automatic. Because I know some Christians that have just uh, are angry at God over things that come into their lives. But am I really accept, an exception to the rule? No, or, nor are you. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to deal with something somewhere in life's journey. Peter deals with that. And I want us to look, if you would please, and we're going we're gonna to read a couple verses of Scripture then make our thoughts. And I'm not going into great, great detail on these. I just want to give you some points for you to ponder and look at. And maybe in the quietness of your own time, you can run a little research and do some studying on your own, which would be advisable. But I do want to give you some thought. So let's read, if you would, and then we'll make our prayer. Let's read verses 6 and 7 out of that first chapter. It says in verse 6, <clears throat> Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. 
Now that's that's interesting, isn't it? It doesn't say a temptation. It's manifold, manifold, many temptations, more than one, and maybe even often. Then verse 7 says that the trial of your faith, that's the purpose of, of the temptations, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The Bible is full of what we would term oxymorons and I think this is one of them because notice what he says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. And verse 7, it says that to try your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perish though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You know, how do we greatly rejoice in trials and temptations? But it says we won't necessarily but we should and so let's make our prayer and then we will see what God has laid on my thoughts just to serve with you father we need you and we trust that your presence will be our strength and the Holy Spirit's anointing will be our joy and use us I pray in these few moments to make a difference in our life for our life and Father, for our sake in you, and that you would be honored and glorified in it. Father, I don't know the situations of people that are sitting before me, but you do. And Lord, I don't know what some have come out of. I don't know what some are perhaps in. And Father, certainly we don't know what's lying before us. But we know that God is in charge of the past, the present, and the future, and we rest in him. So, Father, be in my mind, my heart, and may I be well used with the Holy Spirit in this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want us to look at four truths that are dealt with in this two verses of Scripture. First of all, I want you to notice verse 6. The trials are difficult. I never have known a trial, never experienced a trial that wasn't tough. No one has ever had to deal with me or I've ever said something like this. Oh, that was an easy one. That was a light one. There wasn't much to that. A trial is a trial. And uh, they're not fun. They're not pleasurable. They're not enjoyable. But the ironic part of this is every trial is allowed of God for our benefit. See, God doesn't have to do anything to see what we're made of. God knows what we're made of. But He does allow things to come into life so we know what we're made of to show us our weaknesses as well as our strength. Because, you know, when we're on a mountaintop, when things are really going, going well, uh, we can make easy judgments to other people. We can say, well, I would have never done that. Or I would have done it differently this way or whatever the case may be. When in truth, we don't have any right to open our mouth about what trial someone else is going through when we haven't been there. And uh, we may handle it totally different. And if we are faced with that, we may be surprised ourselves as how miserably we fail. And so we need to be very, very careful. And here's my saying, ignorance has a big mouth. And uh, that's been proven in all of our lives many, many times over when we should just sit back and be quiet and observe and keep our opinions to ourselves. But somehow ignorance has a greasy, greasy slope and it slides in very fast. And we say things, we say, no, I shouldn't have said that. And it's, it's true. So trials are difficult. Ye are in heaviness. That's what it says in verse 6. Ye are in heaviness heaviness god knows our heart god knows our situation god knows where we're at and god knows what we're going through and one of the great comforting truths of the christian is that god knows everything there is about us he knows what's in us at the time we're going through these things and don't ever stop and say uh, that'll never happen to me you don't know what's going to happen to you i don't know what's going to happen to me I know where I'm at right now, but I don't know about 
I have a two-hour drive basically going home. I pray for safety. We trust we'll be safe and arrive home and have an enjoyable evening when we get there and, and enjoy our bed when we get in it and go to sleep tonight. And um, I'm thankful for any good night's sleep I ever get, no matter where I'm at. But uh, trials are difficult. And all of us can say amen to that. And uh, you can think right now, and in your mind, in certain situations, everyone here tonight, your mind will take you back to some place in your life that was particularly difficult and hard, and even wondered maybe at that time, how am I going to get through this? But here you are, and you did get through it. Why is that? Because... He promised, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm with you in this. I don't care what the storm is, what the difficulty is. Uh, observe this. Be still and know that I'm God. And you'll see and he will prove himself in the midst of even that. So trials are difficult. Ye are in heaviness. Then look at the second thing in verse 6. Matter of fact, most all of these are in verse 6, and we'll conclude verse 7. But look what he says in verse 6 again. Through manifold temptations. So trials are not only difficult, but they're different. They're not always the same And to your own life. You, you go through different things. Now, I've been asked uh, on a couple occasions, and I've even wondered it myself, uh, Preacher, uh, why do you think I'm going through this? And in certain situations, uh, I've had people say, um, my sister, one of my sisters, at one time lost a little boy, died of leukemia when he's just a small child. And um, she said, I I'm trying to figure out why God took my child from me. And I've tried to figure out, I, I must have sinned somewhere. Well, now, wait a minute. There, there's several portions of Scripture that's very interesting to me. And one is a conversation with Moses. Uh, Who hath made the lame, the halt, and the blind? Have you ever read that? But you know the last part of that verse? Have not I the Lord? That's interesting to me. God made them. God made the halt. He made the lame. He made the blind. Then you study on one, and, and in John 9, you find this. Remember the man that was born blind? And here he is out in public. And uh, the disciples, the disciples now, not just a person down the street or across the neighborhood or around the block, the disciples that lived and followed Jesus Christ came to Jesus in John 9 and said, Who did sin that this man was born blind? And... Uh, Jesus said, neither. No one sinned to make him blind. Did his mother and dad sin? No. Did this man sin? Well, how could he before he was born? So there's no logic in that reasoning. But Jesus said, I had him born that way that I may be proven and glorified. God had a purpose in that. Now I'm going to tell you something, and not everybody agrees with me this, but God has a purpose in every trial that comes into our life. And I'll guarantee you, first of all, it's for our betterment and His glory. That's it. And you can say something like this, well, here I am. I'm in this adversity. I'm in this trial. I'm in this trouble. And Lord, I don't, I don't, it's, it's like this. I never did like school. Excuse me. I, not, I should have said that in front of these children. But I did. I never enjoyed school. I went to school out of necessity because it was the law and I had to do it. And I was not a good student, not because I was stupid. I just didn't care. But I had enough care to do this. I knew I didn't want to repeat it, so I worked hard enough to pass. <laughs> So, so I did. And so I passed, got my diploma. And then God surprised me and upset my whole world when he called me in the ministry. I knew he'd made his first mistake. And then when I finally obeyed him and I surrendered when I came into the ministry and went to Bible college, started studying, you know what? I was an excellent student. You want to know why? My heart was in that. And I cared about that. And I studied about that. And I did well in college. Now, we have got to understand this, 
that what God allows us to go through, he may not cause it, but he allows it. And what he allows is to his glory and to our benefit. It's to make a better me out of me. It's to make a greater Christian out of me. And it says the world observes me, they see Jesus in me. Amen. Years ago, I pastored, of all places, I pastored in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Many, many years ago. Another century, literally. And uh, there was a little husband and wife, he was a retired pastor, and he's well up into years. And his last name was Rice. Well, his name was Alan Rice. And he was he was just a sweet, precious guy. And his wife was a little bit of petite lady, and she was a sweetheart. Well, Brother Rice became very, very ill. And I got a call, and I'd been in her home a number of times praying with him. And uh, I got a call one night from her. And he was in uh, one of the hospitals there in Kalamazoo. And uh, she said, Pastor said, Alan's not doing well. said, they don't think he's going to live. said, would you come and be with me? I said, sure, well. So I got dressed and went over to the hospital, and uh, I sat with him. He wasn't, he wasn't conscious. And um, I, I sat with her, and she was holding my arm. And, you know, she's old enough to be my mother easily. And um, I said, well, let's have a word of prayer, Sister Rice. And we did, one thing or another. Well, directly she started to weep. They'd been married 67 years. And she she began to weep and cry. And all of a sudden she startled her. Said she went, I can't do this. And I said, you can't do what? She said, I can't break up like this. She said, when I go home, I'll cry. But I can't cry here. And I said, Sister Rice, you have every right to cry here. She said, no, I do not. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I have witnessed and Alan has witnessed to every doctor, every nurse in this hospital that's come into this room and they have heard our faith in Jesus Christ. Now they can't question it. I cannot cry here. That was her thought, her belief. Now after he died, she went home. She boo-hooed a lot. God love her heart. But let me tell you something. The world is in observation to what we say we believe in Christ. And the thing that's going to bring that out of our life is trials. Is trials. So we see in this verse, trials are difficult. They're not going to be easy for us. And expect that and understand that. Ye are in heaviness. And then trials are different. They're not always the same. Same kind of a trial. Same kind of a different temptation. Things of that nature. They're different because it says, Through manifold temptations. Many. Very. Different kinds. So expect that. Then number three. Verse 6 again, notice it says, if need be, if need be, trials are decisive. They make you make a decision. They make you make a decision. You cannot be indifferent to trials that come into your life. You've got to face them. You cannot play ostrich, bury your head, and then later on pull it out and say, oh, it's gone. No, with every trial, there are residuals. With every trial, there are residuals. Years and years ago, I had to be at a hospital in, in Caring, Ohio. One of my men was going in for cancer surgery. And uh, it was early, early in the morning. I had to be there like at 5 o'clock in the morning for him to be going to surgery. And so when they finally got him ready, they let... Uh, his wife and some of his family and me go back and I was going to have prayer and after I had prayer uh, the wife she happened to be my secretary she said pastor said what's wrong with your face I said I don't know I was born this way <laughs> and she said no I'm serious I'm serious she said what's wrong with your face I said I don't know there's something wrong with my face she said yes it is, it's all drawn and she said you're, you're slobbering, preacher. And I thought, man, I haven't done that since I was a kid. And uh, I said, I don't know, Betty. I have no idea. Well, come to find out, I had Bell's palsy. Now, lots of people have Bell's palsy. <coughs> and some people go right through it, don't have a problem one thing or another. 
And uh, I, I began preaching with a hanky for, for a number of weeks. But anyway, there was residuals to mine. And you know what my residual was? I had to get hearing aids. It affected my hearing. And uh, I've known other people who have been affected different ways. But I'm going to tell you this. With every trial of our faith, there are consequences and residuals of revelation to the effect. You got that? <coughs> we are not, we're not going to go through trials that does not make us make a decision. And you know, <coughs> God wants us to where we are willing to make a decision and decide. Now, have you ever been around someone that just can't make a decision? <coughs> they drive me nuts. <coughs> It's hard for me to be around a person like that. Because I do make decisions. You know, and they're not always the right one, but I make them. And uh, you can't just sit on the fence of indifference. And trials make you face the reality <coughs> of what you have to decide to do. And, uh, well, I don't know what to do. <coughs> I'm, I'm faced with this, but what, what do I do? Do something. Don't be indifferent to it. And trials make us grow up. They make us mature in our faith. They don't let us stay in one spot. They just don't. And here's why. Because there's more down the road. And if we don't handle this one wisely, we won't handle those at all. And sometimes God wants us to make even wrong decisions so that we are taught to be more wise of thinking about making a decision. Does that make any sense? But you cannot make no decision. I don't know how good of English that is, but I hope you get it. <laughs> Trials are very decisive. And then, let's conclude on this thought. Look at verse 6 again. The latter part, it says, which, let's just read it, verse 6, which ye greatly rejoice, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. Here's a good part about trials. Are you listening? They don't last forever. They don't last forever. They are a storm that finally has a sunrise. They are a storm that finally has sunshine. They don't last forever. That's a relief. Now sometimes storms are quick. Like when we got ready to leave this morning, didn't have a storm, but just had a little shower, just enough to get you wet before you got in the car. And uh, so that was just for a few minutes. That's all it was. But I've been in storms that last for days. I've been in the Philippine Islands when you didn't think it was ever going to stop. Just storm and buckets. I mean, a, an umbrella didn't help. Get in a typhoon. Have you ever been in a typhoon? Man, I have. And you can't see. Windshield wipers don't even work. Nothing helps. I mean, it is a torrential downpour. And they last sometimes for days. Storms. But they do cease. They do cease. Now, that brings us to really contemplate verse 7. Look at verse 7. That the trial of your faith, the trying, the exercising of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that's the oxymoron. To us, humanly, that doesn't make any sense. There's no logic in that. Because it's not something we want. Oh, I want a trial today. Nobody wants a trial. Nobody. I have a grandnephew that was just accused of something. Well, it wasn't just back a number of months ago. He was accused of something. And it wasn't true. Not true at all. 
not even close to being truth. And so they had a pre-trial, and in that pre-trial, they sent it on to a trial. And just, I got, an F, I got a, a text from his dad, my nephew. And uh, he says, Uncle Roger said, praise the Lord, heard from our attorney that the other individual and the court has dismissed the case completely. It's been totally dropped. And we just had to praise the Lord. You know, sometimes we have the threat of, but it never comes to fruition. There's a possibility. I had uh, recently, I had to have a heart thing done on me to see what's wrong with it. And, uh, you know, the doctor is telling me that it can be this and it can be this, or, or it could be this, and it could be this thing. Well, you know, I was almost ready to go to the funeral home and make plans by the time he got done talking to me. I mean, I already felt like I was almost dead. And so I had to make arrangements, go to have this test done. And so I had the test done. And uh, I went back to the doctor, and the doctor said, oh, I said, it's great. He said, I don't need to check you again for over two years. Well, why didn't you tell me that the first time? You know, I mean, I'm ready to go, but I don't necessarily want to be on this load. You know, I, I, let's, let's put it off for just a little bit. But trials, you know, they're more precious than gold to us because they take away the flesh. Now, don't miss this. They take away the flesh to reveal the faith. Amen. They take away the flesh to reveal the faith. They are more precious than gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. So church, listen to me tonight. Be well aware that in this thing called the school of life, there are trials. Uh, we called them in school exams. Uh, we called them in school quizzes. Depend on the seriousness of them. And some of them were pretty easy because they were open book tests. But we were tried to the knowledge that we were gaining. And I found this out. They always make you study. You want to know more to be better in what you're doing. God's not mad at you. God's not trying to whip you. God is trying to perfect you. That we bury the flesh and we reveal the faith. Trials are difficult. Trials are different. Trials are decisive. But trials don't last forever. Now for a season. Now for a season. Just a little note to give to you. Just a little lesson at something that we need to learn in our life. Preacher, why is this happening to me? Well, I don't know all the answers, but I do know the ultimate end of everything is that God gets the glory out of it and I'm benefited through it. Prayer. I, I don't know if it was the last time I was here but I mentioned the need of a prayer revival. I still believe that. But the ultimate end, now listen to me, the ultimate end to every prayer request is that God gets the glory out of the response. And that's the reason sometimes God says, no, no, 
I'm not going to do that. Or he might say, put it off. You're not ready for that yet. Or he may say, sure, glad to. But in every situation as God's movement is given, the ultimate end is that he gets the glory from it, not me. I'm benefited from his answer, but he's glorified by the answer. And it's the same thing. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I don't know. I don't know. But dear people, this little bitty lesson that I've just given you can be proven in our life to probably be one of the most important that you'll ever learn. Because I can guarantee all of us you're going to experience it. Somewhere, somewhere. And not one time, but many times. God help us learn the lesson. Learn the lesson. And I'm not trying to be silly here at all. But I genuinely did not want to fail in any test. You know what? why? Because I had to redo it. And there's some things I don't want to redo in life. Let me learn my lessons well the first time. May I be hid that He's always seen. May I be silent that He will always be heard. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that in this little lesson, that somebody has been encouraged. Maybe, maybe they have come out of a trial. Now they kind of have a clarification of it. Maybe they're going into, a, uh, into it or they're in the midst of a trial. And this has helped in some way. But Father, we know this. We may be well walking into a trial. Help us to bear it well. Rest in You. Trust in You. And dear God, may you be honored by it and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, preacher.